handmade by here with our roads. You know, for an artist, there's nothing scarier than a blank canvas. That empty white void and its limitless possibilities that lay before you. That first stroke defines everything. Infinite possibilities become finite. Suddenly there's a precedent to work on. It is the same with clay in the hands of a sculptor or uh, cloth in the hands of someone who makes clothes. Uh, the same is also true for writers. We stare down at the empty page beneath our pens, at the blank word doc screens before us, and are paralyzed by the infinite possibility that we are about to truncate. It's intimidating, <laughs> but important. But these first motions are more than just simple establishment. They're the first breaths of life into your world. They show your audience all of the possibility that your story holds. In this capacity, your first chapter, episode, or scene is going to color how your audience sees everything going forward. It's your first impression, so you'd better do it right. So today, let's look at two new shows that just premiered on a channel synonymous with the worst writing. Sci-Fi just brought out two shows, both based on novels, targeting slightly different audiences, but they have a lot of similarities in how they were produced. First is called The Expanse, Sci-Fi's new planet-hopping show, based on novels all of the same name by James S. A. Corey. The second is like a grown-up version of Harry Potter, called The Magicians, done by Lev Grossman, brother of the guy who did Soon I'll Be Invincible, if you like that book. The pilots of these shows are as different as day and night, but they both came out on the same network and they're targeting a similar audience, and only one of them made me want to watch a second episode. Both series have a complex and interesting world. They've got an interesting and pretty chunky cast, and beyond that they have complex and interesting abilities that really show off the uniqueness of the world that they're setting their tale in. Both have some really cool looking monsters. They both tell their stories from varying perspectives. They're on the same network, they appear to have the same budget, they receive similar marketing treatments towards pretty similar audiences, if I'm being completely honest. The actors have a lot of real talent, and while eerily specific, both of their pilots feature a zero-gravity sex scene. So what's the difference, Gideon? Why is one a success in your eyes, and the other one's a failure? Well, it's simple, and I'm going to tell you. The answer is grounding. Let me explain. In The Expanse, the opening scene is a girl trapped in a cell, jealously hoarding her last few drops of water. Wait, just kidding! The first scene in The Expanse is a text crawl! A giant Star Warsian text dump that just details terminology and social issues and a brief history of the stuff that no one cares about. It's like reading a textbook, and it really eats away at me. But you know what it doesn't show us? Names! Then we go on to the girl. The girl hoarding her water, and she keeps hiding from some noisy thing outside. When she eventually goes out there, she wanders around a little bit, runs into the big scary monster that the frame only half shows because they don't want to commit to too much just yet, scream, cut to black, and that character is only minorly and tangentially mentioned or even related to anything that's going on for the rest of the pilot. It's essentially wasted time that really could have been shown a lot quicker if they were going to use it as some foundation for anything at all. My point is, she's never seen or heard from again in this episode, and then we immediately cut to a cop. And this cop is dealing with some uh, miscreants that have been mistreated by society, and then they start going over all those social issues I was talking about again, but now they're showing instead of telling, which means they didn't need to tell because they were just going to show in the first place. Well, see, uh, the cop and his partner, whose names I never learned, uh, immediately wander away from that because, well, they were just showing you complex societal issues that had no bearing on the actual plot of this episode, and they go to solve a crime. And they solve the crime entirely in another language, with no subtitles, and minimal body movement, and it doesn't connect to any other part of the pilot episode. It's essentially just watching two beat cops do their standard stuff in a show that is trying to build a complex and interesting narrative. Again, wasted space. I get it, they're cops. They're gonna work the beat, right? Right? Do I, do I need more? They're cops. Essentially, after showing, not telling, both for the societal issues and to say, yep, see, look, look at the new cop stuff. 
they are wasting precious time from their pilot to cater to the least common denominator and it leaves the rest of us to starve mentally. And then, let's cut to black. Let's ditch these characters too. Because the same with one set of characters is bore and all the 12 year olds will flip to another channel. And so then we're three characters deep, still no names, no real plot threads, and we wasted a quarter of the episode. The next scene actually looks really cool. It's my favorite scene in the entire episode. Two miners are having a general conversation, just dicking around on the job, and we can see uh, the imperfections in their technology. We can even hear it in the fact that their voices are kind of jarbled and a little bit hard to understand. But there's personality in their conversation. It's a real conviction. And just when I'm starting to like these characters, and I think, all right, these are our main characters, finally. A piece of ice snaps off from their mining rig, and for some reason, it hits him and it tears off his arm. Now, uh, instead of focusing on our two minor characters that they developed for a couple of minutes here, and showing the pain and trauma that comes with working this kind of dangerous operation, they instead just treat us to a shot of the arm cartwheeling lazily through space, wasting some more CG budget and avoiding any of the emotions, because emotions are scary, man! Then, we cut to different characters. Again. Now it's that zero-G sex scene I was talking about before, between characters that we don't know. Without context, it's just there for titillation. In this scene, we learn that the main guy, he's our protagonist, by the way, halfway into the episode, nice to meet you, how you doing? Uh, we learn that he doesn't really want responsibility, but he does bemoan the fact that he wants a deep relationship, which seems to kind of run counterintuitive with the responsibility issue, with this girl who's shrugging him off in, a, I guess, a uh, display of girl power, in the fact that she's the one who doesn't want the relationship this time, or something. I, I don't really understand why that was worked in there, other than to show that maybe he wants more responsibility and he lets on. Either way, it's a mildly juicy conversation in this otherwise barren pilot, but it's still not long enough for me to learn anybody's name before the next bit of hyperactive plot punching arrives. Then it's back to the police for a little bit, back to the mining crew for a little bit, back to our pro tag. We get a signal calling out from the depths of space. World's oldest plotter. They decide to go and they're going to investigate and it's looking like it's the ship from the girl at the beginning of the episode with the water and the after the text dump and all that. It's all coming together! Yes! Time for a little bit of validation! It was just getting a slow start, it's gonna be so good! Yes! I'm so excited for it! So they go to the ship and they find... nothing! No girl! No monster! They literally just like walk in and they're like, well, nothing here. Oh look, it's a beacon. And they, they turn around and they decide to go home. And while their ship is in transit back to the main mining outfit, another ship comes out of the black, blows everybody away. The miners, the girlfriend, all of the interesting characters, except for Mr. Protag, the police, and the girl who's got him dead. They're gone. Which means we wasted time getting to know them in the first place because they weren't going to last for more than 15 minutes each. Side note. I'm not even watch this show long enough to understand, but why? Why set a trap like this, luring people off of a mining ship that you've already got outgunned a thousand to one, and then wait for them to trip the trap, blow them up, and then just leave? They aren't even there to eradicate everyone, because they don't. They're not there to steal all the precious water, because they don't. They're not there to infect, enslave, or eat, because they don't. But it's a mining ship. What? What? It's just there as forced tension to set up a mystery ship plot line. At least, that's my humble opinion. So, by the end of this episode, Pseudo-Captain is pretty much the only character alive with any real character development, and his biggest spark of character development is the old murdered girlfriend trope. Uh, the cops don't really get any real development other than playing with some badly CGI birds. Uh, the girl, the monster, the miners... It's not a whistle. It's a really flimsy story bookended by some half-decent CG. I've seen better CG on YouTube. Uh, honestly, this show went on the chopping block for all the right reasons. But then there's the magicians. While it's not like Oscar winning or particularly revolutionary, it's solid and it's certainly a heck of a lot more entertaining to me than The Expanse was. Part of that just happens to do with the opening. The opening scene shows us magic. 
We see a professor walk in through a door-shaped portal from some other world to sit down and have an intense, serious conversation with someone that you can tell is a, a long-term friend about some pretty serious issues that are happening in their world. They discuss the dark currents that are rolling through their world, which is shown physically through a large, seemingly magical moth that one is carrying with them dead. It shows that there are dark forces afoot, things to be taken seriously, and it gives us an emblem to hold on to. Their conversation culminates in them sharing a little bit of bravado between each other, and then they talk about a student, a potential student, that they've been keeping an eye on. And that segues perfectly into the introduction of our protagonist. We meet Quentin Coldwater, who's having a psychiatric evaluation. Sure, it's a little trophy, but it beautifully outlines who his character is, showing us his strengths and weaknesses. He starts doing coin magic, showing us his passion, and then through a series of small flashbacks, shows his awkwardness at parties and how he feels ostracized from society at large because of his more nerdy interests. We're also introduced to two of his most beloved friends, Julia, who he calls Jules, and Julia's boyfriend. Within minutes, we can see the tension between these two characters building. We can tell that Q, at least at one time, had a thing for Julia, but it's faded now. The door between the two of them is closed, most definitely, because Julia has a fiancé. It's a collapsing love triangle, which is way more interesting than your garden variety amorous shape. Love, love triangle. But before we can get comfortable with these characters, wham! Magic! The characters are both whisked off to this school called Breakbills, where they're tested for their magical aptitude. More like at not Hogwarts, where they're not sorting hat. You get it, it's kind of the same thing for college kids. It's still pretty cool. They're tested for their magical aptitude, and while Q has the gift, Jules is lacking. And so while Quentin is whisked off into a room to be put under psychological stress by his mentors and awaken his magic, Julia is whisked off to have her memory erased. She subverts this trope by gouging herself in the arm with one of her rings to evoke pain, nature's best and brightest tutor. We meet some of the side characters. Q goes on to study and learn the basis of his world, while Jules becomes obsessed with finding out what she shouldn't know. And in her uh, lust for finding out more about Breakbills, the school that rejected her, she stops eating, she starts behaving erratically, which also justifies the fact that they are wiping kids' memories because if they're going to become like that, you got to take magic away from them entirely to let them function. We also meet a couple of side characters and Quentin's roommates, and then the Zero Z sex scene happens, but now it's to show off a form of magic in an interesting way that's not just, what can you can do? I can push objects! It's an interesting way to show off telekinesis, and it builds a strong relationship between these two characters that lasts and is a definite, strong plot point. It's good. Q learns about the hierarchy of all the different students at his school. We see an average day-to-day -day lesson so that we're grounded in the curriculum, and he even starts to make a new friend in not Hermione, Alice. As a dark mirror, Jules sinks deeper and deeper into her need for power, culminating in a birthday party where she is definitely not into it. She drags Quentin away just to show him that she's learned some minor parlor trick that wouldn't even earn a failing grade at Quentin's school of break bills. And beyond that, she heads to the bathroom where she has her shirt torn off and is tied to a radiator by a man with magical aptitude. And we learn that this is the darker school's way of eliciting that emotional response like Quentin had earlier with his teachers in a way to awaken her magical talent. It works, but the jarring nature of this kind of bizarre cruelty really highlights how uh, dim magic can be outside of the institutes of higher learning. Thus, we're also shown the darker side of magic, the unregulated side of magic. And then the show does one better by showing us that it is not just the bad guys who will be using said magic. Our not Hermione coaxes our protagonist, clan, into performing a dark spell to open up a doorway for her to communicate with her long-lost brother. It's creepy, and it culminates in not actually opening a door for her brother, but for something far darker. Near the end of the first episode, 
The door opens and the beast emerges, a man whose face is made up of a cloud of moths. He immediately dismisses the powers that be, questioning the safety of all of the students and showing that it's not Hogwarts. You're not going to be safe till book seven this time. Uh, not at, not at break bills. Oh, God, no. It also establishes a fantastic antagonist and shows the true darkness that they could be fighting, or at least a glimpse of it. So, at the end of The Expanse, we had one character with a bit of minor, you know, exposition, facing a pretty crappy end goal. Uh, some CG birds and police, and uh, a girl who uh, may be eaten by a monster. At the end of the first steps of The Magicians, we have an entire cast of both good and anti-good main characters, uh, a definite villain, a staff. We've got a social hierarchy, spells of both good and ill. We show when magic goes right, when magic goes wrong, and how they interact with people who are non-magical, all in one hour. This is why you can't afford to just throw money at the problem like The Expanse did and hope that CG keeps people watching. You only get one first impression, so you'd better do it right. I hope that this illuminates how starting a story can be the most important step that you take as a writer, because you're going to end up on somebody's chopping block, and it better not be mine. Join us next week on Pen Made Miter, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Made by dear without rod